When Augustine of Hippo lay dying, the year 430, he had the words of our text inscribed on the bed beside him, Psalm 32. He had just finished his great work, The City of God, The Vandals, that charming Germanic tribe from the north, was at the gates laying siege. They threatened to burn the city down. And Augustine, in his final days, was reading this text. It's interesting to me that he would choose this text. If you've read his confessions and you know that Romans 13 was of great importance to him, that was the passage by which he was converted. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, it says there. That's where he started his Christian life. But now at the end, he's looking to Psalm 32. Why is that? Well, our psalm is all about forgiveness. It provides assurance that we do indeed belong to God. And so it makes sense as one is facing the threshold of eternity, thinking back upon all the mistakes of life, that he would want to be sure that he indeed belongs to God. We need that text at the end of life, but we also need it in the middle of life, here and now, in the mundane rhythms and routines to be assured that we who were far off, strangers and aliens to the covenant of promise, have indeed been drawn near, that we belong to the King. And so let's begin Psalm 32 and verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Perhaps this brings the first psalm to mind. There we have similar language. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor does he stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And as he meditates upon that word, what happens? His life flourishes. It is robust. It is fruitful. It's the same Hebrew word. It appears first in Psalm 1 and then again in Psalm 32 and verse 1. It is the blessed life. We talked about this at great length in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. There, I used the image of a stained glass. The, the beauty of God, the splendor of God shines into our souls and it fills us in such a way that we radiate that life and hope into the world. There's no greater joy. There's no greater privilege than to be a conduit of God's steadfast love. And so you might say that Psalm 1 is concerned with how we enjoy that life in obedience. See, saying no to sin, saying yes to righteousness, that's how we radiate it. Psalm 32 is concerned with how we enjoy that life when we blow it, when we make mistakes, when we commit that familiar sin. That is to say, how we lay hold of this life by way of repentance and restoration. It's a masculine of David. That word describes instruction that's of a moral nature. It's wisdom. It's concerned with how we live, and we're to meditate on it. That's the meaning of the word selah, to reflect upon, to, to consider this truth. We find it three times here in our passage so verse 2, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. David describes the problem with three words, transgression, sin, and iniquity. Transgression is simply rebellion. It's when we wave our fist in God's face and say, in effect, I want to do it my way. Sin is missing the mark. Now think archery. Our family went to Blackwell Forest Preserve recently. We took the littles, and uh, my son Malachi was like Robin Hood. He was hitting the target. My daughter was like uh, Susan from the Chronicles of Narnia. I was like Mr. Bean, altogether spastic, unable to do this thing. That's the human story, right? There's the target. It's divine holiness and righteousness, and we routinely fall short, missing the mark. And then we have iniquity. This describes perversion, to be morally twisted. Think of Gollum from The Lord of the Rings. He, he has that obsession, and it warps him. 
Now, David knew something of this experience. Uh, There are some who believe that this psalm was written after David was confronted by Nathan the prophet following his sin with Bathsheba. And the reason some commentators believe that is because the content is very similar to Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 explicates that particular occasion or situation. That may be. Regardless, all of us know what this is like. The good thing we want to do, we don't do. Instead, we find ourselves doing the very thing we wish to avoid. Paul in Romans 7. And so we wonder, is there any hope? Can I be liberated from this vicious cycle? Well, David points us in the right direction with three more words. Forgive, cover, and count or impute. Forgive means to bear or to carry. Think of the Day of Atonement when the high priest lays his hand upon the scapegoat, confessing the sins of the people, and then that goat takes the sins far away. That's what the Lord does for us. As we read later in the Psalms, He separates from us our sins as far as the east is from the west. This word count, uh, sorry, cover, means to conceal from one's sight. You think of Luther's analogy of the dunghill. One day he's with his students, he looks out the window and he sees this pile of manure. He points to it and says, that's what we're like in our sin. We're wretched in the sight of God. And then after an hour, the snow fell in Wittenberg, and now that that hill had turned into a lovely white mound of snow gleaming in the sunlight. Luther pointed to it again and said, that's what we look like in the sight of God when we are in Christ. We reflect his perfect righteousness, you see, covered. And then finally counted or imputed. This is a legal term. It's vindication. It is justification. We we find it in Romans 4, the passage that was read for us earlier. Paul says that God credits righteousness to us. And on that basis, he accepts us as his children. So here's the question. How do we get there? How do we move from the shadow lands with guilt and shame weighed down to the place where we see the smile of God? How can we go from being like the prodigal son in the mud surrounded by pea pods to making our way back home and enjoying the warm embrace of the Father? That's the question we'll consider this morning from our text And we'll see here three movements from disgrace to delight. We continue in verses 3 and 4. It starts in the place of disgrace. David says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all the day long. He kept it to himself. His conscience was pricked. He was convicted. He knew he had done wrong, and yet... He chose to remain silent, recognizing that there would be consequences to his sin. I think Gollum is a a vivid illustration that works here. He's in the the caves of the misty mountains down deep, and, and his heart is attached to this precious ring of his, and what happens? He becomes twisted, you see. His mind and his his heart are deformed, and it changes him in very real ways. Not just the way he thinks, but his whole personality. He goes from being a, a hobbit to this creature. And that's what happens to us when we invest all of our affection and all of our allegiance in some created thing. I like to quote uh, Greg Beale, who says of this phenomena, when we, when we worship some idol, he says, what we revere, we will resemble, either for restoration or for ruin. Well, he, this is all about ruin in this case. There is a connection, you see, between the spirit and our physical bodies. It takes a toll on you when you're hiding some sin You can't let your spouse see your phone. You can't have the the inbox open. The history on your browser has to be kept private. All of that works on you. It it captivates your, your attention and your limbic system, and it weighs you down emotionally, physically. 
David said again, his strength waned. He groaned all the day long. Well, of course it did, because we're embodied creatures. And there's an integral connection between our spiritual life and our physical life. And so our health wastes away when we are in this place. David describes it in Psalm 31 this way, my eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. My strength fails. Why? Because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Now, I have known two men in my life, two ministers of the gospel, who indulged in gross sin and they hid it. They lived double lives and they did so for quite a long time. And instead of coming clean, instead of responding to the convicting work of the Spirit, they, they chose to double down. And in both of those cases, those men eventually became ill and died. And you wonder, is that a coincidence? Could it be that God actually brought their life to an end? Well, maybe so. I mean, think of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30 describing those who partake of the supper unworthily. He says, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. David is feeling the stress of a, of a double life. It leaves him dry and hollow. He's wasting away as he keeps silent. Now, I need to offer a qualification. Sin is not always the cause of illness. If you're struggling emotionally or in some other way, you should not assume it's because of sin. Job would, of course, be exhibit A for this insight, right? Don't want to make that mistake. But it is always good for us in any circumstance to come before the Lord and say, search me, O God. Is there something that I am failing to see in this moment? Well, verse 4 David continues, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. Maybe you have felt this exhaustion. I used to play soccer, and I can remember a couple of occasions playing for hours without water and being at the end of myself physically. Well, there's a spiritual equivalent to this. David calls it heaviness, pressure, it's, it's conviction when God is bearing down upon you. You say, why would God do that? Why would God inflict that on me? I thought God is love. Well, that is love, you see. When God sees us moving in a dangerous direction, He loves us so much that He's going to extend His hand to get our attention, to bring us to a place of repentance. That's what we see here. Hebrews 12, 6, the Lord disciplines the ones He loves. And he chastises every son he receives. The time to worry is when we're engrossed in sin and we don't feel any remorse or conviction. When we're just going on with it as though everything is okay. Paul talks about that as well in Romans 1 when he describes God giving up certain people. We don't want to be there. That is the place of damnation. I mentioned a few weeks ago, just in passing, a good friend of mine, a ministry leader who's, who's had an affair, and um, there's not a morning I don't wake up in which I don't think of him, and Angela and I are serving the family, and it's heart-wrenching. He's sitting in a crater of destruction, and the, the hardest part, I think, is, is the facade that over the course of so many months when we would be together, it looked as though everything was just fine, when in fact it wasn't. And that provokes two responses in me personally. Number one, it leads me to say, oh Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner, but by the grace of God do we live. But number two, it, it leads me to pray for you, New Covenant Church. After all, that's what pastors do. The most important thing I can do as a pastor new covenant is to pray for the congregation. And so in this moment, I find myself praying for you in a very specific way, asking God to provide conviction where it is needed, to send the searching light of His Spirit 
so that if we find ourselves in that place, I don't know, I love talking with you in the narthex, you're so kind, you tell me my sermons are good even when they're lousy, it's really nice. I don't know what's really happening behind closed doors, but the Lord knows. And my prayer is, oh God, would you open up our lives so that we would do business with whatever needs attention. And so that's my plea to you this morning. If you're indulging in some secret sin, let it go. Let it go. It says that the prodigal son in Luke 15, when he came to his senses, he said, this I will do. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. May God give us that kind of grace. Well, that leads to the second movement of our passage. Verse 5, a movement of repentance. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah. The word repentance means to change our mind, metanoia in the Greek language. That's the, the primary word that's used to describe it in the New Testament. And as we change our mind, we change our orientation. We were walking this way, away from God, with the light of His presence behind Him. We enter deeper dimensions of darkness in our own shadow, but now we're torn, turned toward Him, and we see the radiance of His face. Again, David's description comes in a set of three. The verb acknowledge means to admit, to finally come clean, to be honest. Did not cover, this is a similar idea. Just imagine gluing wallpaper over a moldy wall. That's what happens when we hide our sin. David said, I'm not willing to do that. I'm going to let it be exposed. And third, to confess, confess to the Lord. Here's something to, all, to keep in mind, never lose sight of. We can go a long way from God. We can wander to a distant country. But the moment we turn around in repentance, God is right there. He's right there. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. That's the wonder of the gospel. God is so eager to forgive us and to embrace us. It makes me think of the Pharisee and the tax collector. What a contrast. The, the Pharisee approached worship and he said to the Lord, oh, thank you that I'm not like this other man, pointing to the tax collector. And what did he do? Well, he stood away off and he couldn't even lift his eyes toward heaven. And he said, oh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Isn't it interesting how he identified with his sin? I am a sinner. And then there's this plot twist. It's not the religious leader who was justified. No, it was the broken, humble an honest tax collector. What does this have to do with Advent? Everything. This is why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came not for the healthy, but for the sick. He came to rescue us. And so, let's take David's invitation. Again, Selah. Are we like the religious leaders? Do we come before God, satisfied with our performance, or we like the tax collector? Do we find it difficult to look toward heaven? That is until we remember the love of God that sent His Son to die for us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that leads to the third movement, the way of salvation, verses 6 through 9. Therefore, let everyone who's godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. You see, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time for us to turn and recognize the wondrous mercy of God. Isaiah 55 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him 
while he is near. We find the same note struck in Psalm 95. Today, it says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. While we have this awareness, let's be responsive. Why is it so important to take action now? Well, as one friend of mine said the other day, I was chatting with him about this text. He said, you know, it seems to me, Chris, sin makes us stupid. It's true, isn't it? We, we, we entertain thoughts we would, we would never think about in our right mind, but, but when we're bent on some sin, we get delusional. And there's a compounding effect. The more we invest in that thought, the more we develop that idea, we become more and more blind, become more and more dull of heart. And so we can't presume that just because we're inclined to respond now, that we will feel that way tomorrow. Well, what happens when we turn for 6b? Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. David uses this metaphor in Psalm 29 about the waters of judgment that come and it envisions Noah's ark. That's the place of salvation. That's the place of safety. Think of 1 Peter 3. We go there in order to be protected that's the refuge. That's, that is the calling to enter the ark while there's time. Because there, of course, was a moment in which the floods began and the doors of the ark were shut. And there was then no longer opportunity for one to enter. Verse 7, in this same vein, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. Yet again, David gives us this threefold repetition. A hiding place. Imagine a flash flood and suddenly the water comes roaring through the wadi or the ravine. It's only by going up high that you will find safety. That is God. He's that hiding place. Preservation, this word can be translated shield. Oh, how we need God to shield us, to protect us, because we live not on a playground but in a battlefield and there are spiritual arrows flying by us all the time. The Lord protects us. He keeps us. He guards us. And then thirdly, He surrounds us, literally encircles us. And He does it with songs of deliverance. There's a beautiful expression of this in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. It says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. It's filled with paternal and maternal images there, that kind of nurture, that care that affection, that intimacy, that personal relationship, as theologians say, cor ad cor locutor, heart speaks to heart. That's how God relates to us. Yes, there is a legal dimension to salvation, but let's not lose sight of the fact that it's deeply personal. God cares for us. Verse 8, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Imagine, if you will, a butler, and he's beside the table, and his master simply, simply looks at the half-filled cup. The butler's on it. He knows, put water in that cup. The master just looks at the salt shaker, and the, the butler gets the message. Why? Because he's dialed in. He's that attentive. That's the idea. We are so devoted to the living God. We give him our attention by looking at his word that he can easily direct us, you see. And that is contrasted by what we find next in verse 9. Don't be like the horse or the mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. David understood horses. He was a man of war. And he's saying here, don't be the kind of follower that needs to be managed by external coercion, by bits and bridles and whips. Proverbs 26, a whip for the horse, a bridle for a donkey, and a rod 
for the backs of fools. And a positive example of this is Joseph in Potiphar's house. You know the story of Joseph from Genesis. He was hard done by his brothers, sold into slavery. Look, who could uh, fault Joseph for being a victim? He was in so many ways victimized. And, and now he finds himself in Potiphar's house. And Mrs. Potiphar is coming on to him. Joseph's a young man. His hormones are in fifth gear. I don't know what you see. I think of Catwoman. Uh, I, I, I grew up in the 70s. I used to watch Batman. Remember the Adam West, right? Whenever Catwoman, mama mia. I, I mean, I was confident he could beat the Joker and the Riddler, but Catwoman came on the scene. I wasn't so sure. Uh, this is the idea. This is how Mrs. Potiphar is coming at him. And what does Joseph do? He flees. Why does he flee? Because he feared God. Because he was devoted to God. He cared more about what God thought than anything else in life. Even what his own body was telling him in that moment. We learn from the New Testament that in Christ we are simultaneously just and sinner. This is where we live. Okay? So what that means is this. You and I have the capacity to be like David. David was on the roof, and then he saw Bathsheba, who was sunbathing. I don't know what that was about. It wasn't kosher, I can tell you that. This is not prescribed in the Mosaic law, sunbathing in the sight of the king. So there's David. We can be like him. We can be stupid. We can look at Bathsheba and say, wow, look at Bathsheba, and then take the next step toward destruction. Or we also have the capacity to be like Joseph, you see. Because we are children of God. Because we have the Holy Spirit who lives within us and our hearts have been renewed so that we can, we can, we can say no to sin. Oh, it's so difficult at times, the gravitational pull of our flesh. And yet, the Lord has drawn us to himself and he takes residence, up residence within us so that we can indeed say no to those things that will dishonor the name of Christ. And by his mercy, we can say yes to that which leads to righteousness. Well, this is precisely the point of verse 10. Many of the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord Steadfast love, chesed, right? Think Exodus 34. The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That's covenant loyalty. That's God's commitment to, to provide for you all that you need to walk with him. I think of the woman caught in adultery. I mean, there's so many examples in Scripture. But you know, in John 8, we have Jesus. He's teaching in Jerusalem, and somehow... The Pharisees got hold of this woman is in the act of adultery and they bring her to him and they say to him, to him uh, Jesus, Rabbi, Mos Moses tells us that such a woman should be stoned. What do you say? And John tells us they were trying to catch him. And Jesus bent down and he, and he begins to write in the sand as an allusion to uh, Exodus, the giving of the law, I think. It was a subtle way of saying, I'm the one who actually delivered the law of Moses. And then he gets up, and he looks at the religious leaders, and he simply says, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. And what happens? They drop their stones one by one. Here's what it says in verse 9. When they heard it, they went away, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This is hesed. This is steadfast love. This is how the living God relates to us. He doesn't condemn he doesn't push us down. He lifts us up and he says, I want you to know me. I want you to walk with me. 
Well, as we bring this sermon to a conclusion, I think there are probably three types of people here this morning listening to these words in three ways. The first person is walking with God by His mercy. You haven't been enjoying, you have been enjoying His fellowship. And as you hear these words, your response is summarized in verse 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all ye upright in heart. The second type of person is here this morning and you have been harboring some sin and and right now your heart is hard, it's calloused. And even though you might recognize these words as true, they are bouncing off your soul. If that is you this morning, then I want to give you Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 where Peter says, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out so that days of refreshing may come. That's the promise of God. Renewal. And then there's the third person. And the third person is here saying, I am sick and tired of my sin. My life is miserable. I know God has something more for me, but I just can't break this habit. I just can't turn away. You talk about Gollum, and I can relate to it. And the cry of your heart is one of desperation. You need God's mercy. Well, I am here today to tell you, that is why Jesus came. That is why Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. And that is why God raised him from the dead so that he is alive even now seated at the right hand of God, desiring nothing more than to extend his empowering grace to you in this moment. This, my friends, is the meaning of Advent. This is why we gather together this morning. I read it already. I'll say it again. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that what Augustine said so many years ago is still true today, that you are more anxious to bestow your blessing on us than we are to receive it. And so please, we humbly pray, give us grace, give us mercy to repent and receive your forgiveness. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.